Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm a U of T PA grad currently working at SickKids in the Department of Emergency Medicine. How would you describe or define pediatric emergency medicine? Hmm. Well, in Peds Emerge, we see anybody under the age of 18, so right from birth, like um, difficult labor and birth at, from a midwife at home, all the way up to their 17th and 364th day on this planet. And we will see everybody for any complaint. So we're very much the safety net. Um, everything ranging from the sniffles to abdominal pain to kids who have been hit by a car. Um, so we'll see anything that comes in our door. A lot of the times, because we are that tertiary care center, we are considered the expert location, we'll get a lot of parents and families who are frustrated, um, and they come to us for answers because they've had a hard time or lack of resources. Um, so we see those patients that sometimes other doctors need extra help on and they refer into us. We see those patients who sometimes think that they weren't getting enough care in other locations. And we'll see those patients who are really close to us. Sometimes they just need kind of that reassurance, um, but oftentimes they do need a lot of interventions, whether that's IV fluids and antibiotics, whether it's setting a broken bone, or whether it's advanced imaging, CT scans, and ultrasounds. Um, so everything and anything under the age of 18 is a fair game for us. Can you describe the practice setting or department? Are there different areas? How many PAs, et cetera? So there's Four areas in the emergency. There's four areas in the emergency department. Um, we have our east and west area, so those are our higher acuity areas. Ideally, east is supposed to be for more kind of those complex chronic patients, um, and west is for the ultra high acuity patients. Though that doesn't always happen, and sometimes we have to flow them from one to the other. We also have our trauma resuscitation area in the emergency department, which houses up to four patients. Um, hopefully, we never have to reach that, but it's happened with big accidents and bus rollovers and other things. And then we also have kind of our urgent care area where we see some of the lower acuity patients. That being said, a lot of the times our lower acuity patients come in because we see so many patients. We have such a high volume of patients. One out of every so many patients in that low acuity area is actually gonna have something that's kind of sinister and sneaky and is actually very urgent and needs some emergency intervention. In the eMERGE, we have six PAs. So I was actually the second cohort of PAs to be hired. So I was really fortunate that I had an amazing group, Julia and Claire, who came in right before me and they really helped establish the PA role in the department, establish directives for us as well. Um, then there was my cohort, so Emma and myself. And then we just hired two more PAs in the last year, so Brayden and Elise. We work mostly during the peak hours that patients come in. So the morning and the after school evening hours. We work both weekends, evenings, and holidays because the emergency room never quits. Um, occasionally we'll have to do an overnight shift, but those are thankfully quite rare for us, and we average about one overnight shift, one or two overnights per month. And do PAs uh, spend time in all of the areas, or are you more focused on... Uh, one or the other? Yeah. yeah, so we spend about 75% of our time, I would say, in the urgent care side and probably 25 then in the more emergent side. It's just a matter of where our patient volumes are. So one of the roles of the PA in our department is to be flexible and to keep an eye on where the wait times are for patients. Sometimes, be just because of one thing after the other, they have to always see the, the most acute patient first. You'll end up with patients waiting who are still emergent and on the high acuity side, but they've been there for several hours. So then they might move us over to see those patients as well. Mm -hmm. So can you describe um, a typical shift, for example? How many patients would you see? Where would you float around? Right. Um, so our typical shift, we do eight-hour shifts. Um, and we try to stay our, as best as we can in one section of the emergency department when we are there. Obviously, if need dictates, we will flow ourselves from one area to the other area. But we, we try to stay in one part of the department. Typically, I try to see between three, about three patients per hour that I'm there. It can vary a lot. So on days where everybody's having cough and there's a terrible stomach flu going through the daycare, um, I might be able to see some extra patients because I know that there's a terrible stomach flu going through the daycare, a patient's very classical for it, they're not dehydrated, and we can do some counseling with the parents. Some days it's obviously a lot slower. So when we have those complex patients come in, when we have a sickle cell patient come in and they're having chest pain or they're having neurologic symptoms and we're starting to worry about a stroke or other more complicated problems, that can obviously slow down how we're flowing through patients. I, I would say on average, I'm trying to see around 15 and 16 patients an hour, 
in my eight hour shift, we, we aim for three, but it usually ends up being 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. And how many shifts are you doing a week? Um, on average, I do four shifts a week. Yeah. Some, some weeks, because we do shift work, um, I'll work three shifts, some I will work five, but on average it evens out to about four. And um, can you just give us a list or a sample of some of the common conditions that you see in the ER, PCR? So tons, tons and tons of upper respiratory tract inf infections. Please get your flu shot. <laughs> my, my free plug. Um, abdominal pain and constipation, appendicitis, common fractures like your supracondylar fracture, your clavicular fractures. Um, those are really kind of our bread and butter type of things, along with stomach flu and every, every other type of viral illness under the sun. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the rare conditions that you've seen come through? So again, because we're a tertiary care center, we see a lot of rare conditions. Um, some of the better known rare conditions, things like cystic fibrosis, which is still actually an ultra rare disease when you look at the actual incidence in the population. Um, but other things like moya moya and um, genetic disorders that aren't even listed on up to date yet. We see a ton of different presentations and different levels of prevalence. And what are some procedures that you perform autonomously as a PA? So autonomously, we will perform laceration repairs. We do a lot of laceration repairs um, in the emergency room. We'll also do foreign body retrievals. So kids love sticking things in their nose and their ears, and we're the ones that will help get that out. We also do some like nursemaid elbows and other simple relocations like that. Because they're kids, we're a little bit sensitive about a lot of our kids need some eggs anxiolysis for that and because of the PA scope we're not able to order medications like midazolam um, and fentanyl which we use routinely for procedures so when those medications are involved we have to have a physician involved as well. Casting and splinting. Um, we're really lucky that our nurses probably do a lot of our casting. We do some of the circumferential casts so we don't do a lot of slabs but um, we'll do circumferential casts um, if the need arises, and we'll also do cast removal and other things like that. And are you prescribing medications or initiating management in the ER as well? Yeah, so we got medical directives about a year and a half ago now, um, and they're, they're quite broad, so fluids, antibiotics, um, blood work, x-rays, ultrasounds, so all of that's kind of within our scope, and we'll start the management, especially if it's something that we're very familiar with, kind of autonomously and then after some of those results start to come back we'll review with our physician in more detail. Mm -hmm. So you had a mini orientation to the PCR because you did clerkship mm -hmm. and then it was right into the job yeah. um, but for a brand new hire to the PCR like you've had for the two new ones mm -hmm. what does orientation look like for them? So our orientation at the PEDS Emerge is actually lasts for about a month um, so they get the normal HR what to do in the case of a fire what like this is how you find your pay stub and then we pair up one of the new higher PAs with one of the senior PAs. So they do a little bit of shadowing for about the first week or so, and then the senior PA starts to act as kind of a preceptor. So going in and reviewing some of the patients, talking about some of the learning points with them. Um, we also have tons and tons of resources that the hospital provides us, both like written material like textbooks and Canadian Pediatric Society guidelines, as well as actual hands-on didactic sessions. So um, we get our advanced pediatric life support class taken care of, we get um, hands-on teaching for ultrasound with our POCUS fellows, so lots of different things that kind of, they work really well with us both from the physician side and the senior PA side in order to help us succeed in our role. Mm -hmm. And what do you enjoy about PCR? I love the kids. Um, I don't think I can go back to adult medicine, I think they, I think they sold me on pediatrics. Um, the, the kids are amazing. Like, they're so resilient and so brave, especially the ones that have these chronic medical needs and they're really familiar with the, the healthcare system. From such a young age, you see that resilience and that kind of determination in them. Um, and then the staff, the, the whole culture is great. I love the culture of emergency medicine and I love the culture of pediatrics and this kind of combines the best of both. Um, going through the specialties in school, I found each one had their own culture and parts of it I always liked and parts of it I always disliked. And I just found that the willingness to learn, the compassion of the pedi pediatricians, the, the eagerness and the nobility of Emerge all kind of combined really well into that peds Emerge piece for me. And, and it keeps things fresh and it keeps things interesting and it, I, I have a different day every time I go into shift and, and that's something I absolutely love about my job. Mm -hmm. And what are some challenges with working with that pediatric population? So some of the challenges are some of the things that I love. Sometimes it's emotionally exhausting dealing with kids. Um, whether it's the 
two-year-old who just won't stop crying because he's sick, whether it's an emotionally exhausting conversation that you have to have with a parent about your child is a new diabetic or a new leukemia patient. Um, so it can be emotionally exhausting at times. We have a really great support system set up at work for when we're feeling that. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge of my job, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes the shift work can also be exhausting. So I work the nights and evenings and weekends and holidays. I don't work all of them. We have a big enough group of PAs that we trade amongst ourselves, but you know, I'm not doing family medicine where I have a nine-to-five job. I knew that coming in to the job. Um, it was kind of a compromise that I was willing to take in order to do Emerge because I fell in love with it. Um, but, but it's exhausting. I can see myself moving at some point in the distant, distant future into something more nine to five. Mm -hmm. And can you speak to some of the sessions that you've taught or workshops that you've uh, facilitated recently? <laughs> recently. Um, so we just did the point of care ultrasound workshop at the CAPA 2019 conference. I've heard good things so far in terms of reviews. Um, it was an amazing team effort again. I had. PAs come from sick kids. I had PA students get involved. I had ultrasound fellows and ultrasound staff get involved. So it was a, it was a big group effort. Um, I also have my brother, he was a nursing student, get involved. I have to shout out to him. Um, yeah, I think the workshop went very well. I, I'm happy that I was able to teach somebody a hands-on skill that I use every single day that I think changes how I manage probably half of my patients um, and I think is ultimately better for patients than some of the more traditional modalities. Can you speak to POCUS? Like what is it and um, why is it making such a big impact on your practice? So POCUS is point of care ultrasound. It's ultrasound that's performed at the bedside by a non-radiologist. We use it a lot in the pediatric eMERGE both because we want to save kids radiation. So if that means I can save them a chest x-ray, that would be fantastic. Um, it also helps with our cognitive offloading. So if I put the probe, the ultrasound probe, onto a child and I see a pneumonia, I don't need to worry about why they're short of breath anymore. I see the issue and I can focus my attention to treating instead of solving a mystery. Um, lastly, it helps with our patient flow. Sometimes to get a patient to go outside the department is either not safe because they're unstable or it just takes a long time and, and they're stuck in the ultrasound, ultrasound department or the x-ray department for however long because they're also overworked and backed up so it might be half hour, 45 minutes that they're gone um, on a bad day and to be able to help that patient faster and by virtue of helping them faster, help the patients in the waiting room faster as well, that's, that's super beneficial to us. And that's great, that's a skill that PAs can, uh, can take on. Mm -hmm. So how do you get competent or where can PAs learn focus? So there's a couple different ways. So I'm really fortunate because the hospital I work at has an ultrasound fellowship and they've allowed me to tag on, not as an official fellow, but they're all amazing at teaching and they've let me tag on to their rounds and their teaching lectures and their bedside rounds. So they've really been fantastic for me. And then we have some formal modules in place in order to ensure that we're competent. And we have some online evaluations that are, are all of our scans get reviewed by an expert to ensure that they're meeting standard. Um, other ways that PAs can get competent in ultrasound, so the Scarborough General Hospital, their, their M-Wave POCUS team actually has a ultrasound fellowship available for PAs, so PAs that are practicing are welcome to apply to that fellowship um, and that's one way that they can get competent in emergency medicine ultrasound. There's also lots of courses that are available outside. Um, there's the U-Star course at Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, there's a couple of courses, I think there's some courses through the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians that PAs are eligible to take. So it really depends on where you're working and what exactly you want to do with this skill. Mm -hmm.